All right, now, is Jesus anti-work? Now, as I read to you, as I said in Matthew 25th chapter, he's not anti-work. Called the person who did not multiply the talents, slothful and a wicked servant. But what about salvation? Was Jesus anti-work when it comes to salvation? In John the 6th chapter, after the feeding of the 5,000, people came looking for Jesus, and they were looking for him diligently, and they were going all over Capernaum and so on. And when they finally found him, he said this in verse 26. And he meant this in a spiritual sense and not in a physical sense the way the people were looking at it because they were looking for more food. But he says, according to salvation, Verily, verily, I say unto you, verse 26, Ye seek me not because you saw the miracles, but because you did eat of the loaves and were filled. See, they weren't seeking Jesus for spiritual needs, salvation, they were looking for more food. Jesus says in verse 27, Labor not for the meat which perishes, but for that meat which endureth unto the eternal life. He said to labor not for the physical food, but for the spiritual food, the spiritual bread. And later on in that chapter, he says he is the bread of God, the manna that came down from heaven. He says, labor for that meat which endures unto eternal life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you, for he, for in him hath God the Father sealed. So Jesus says to labor. Now, in Revelation, let's go to Revelation, a couple of scriptures more here. In the book of Revelation, the second chapter, here are the churches, and... Jesus had somewhat against some of the churches here in the book of Revelation. And he says here to the book, uh, to the church of Ephesians, he says this. He says, Nevertheless, I have somewhat against you, because thou hast left thy first love. What is the love of God? Well, 1 John 5, 3. This is the love of God that we keep his commandments. The Ten Commandments of God, the law of God. The law of God, do you realize that the law of God is the law of love? A lot of people don't realize that. And it's plain in the Old and the New Testaments that God's law is the law of love. You have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, the first works, or else I will come quickly, and I will remove thy candlestick out of your place, except thou repent. Then a little later on in verse 26 of Revelation 2, he says, And he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, the end of his life, for when Jesus comes again, to him I will give power over the nations. That's eternal life. And Matthew the 24th chapter, verse 13, what does it say? He that endures unto the end shall be saved. Same statement. To he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, to him I will give power over the nations. So, when it comes to salvation, Jesus plainly is plainly saying here that there are works involved. Totally different from what the mainstream fundamentalists uh, believe. They think there is no works. They talk about grace and faith. But they don't understand what grace and faith actually means. And I'm going to go through that with you a little later on in the program. So, Jesus says that he, we should keep what works? Notice he says, my works. The Bible makes a clear distinction between the works of God and man's works. See, the works of God is righteousness. It's his law. The works of man is sin and human nature. And that's the clear distinction the Bible makes, and that's the distinction that Jesus makes here, that we have to keep His works, the saving works of God, and not our works. And that's the, the clear distinction the Bible makes. And let's go to Isaiah, the 64th chapter. And in Isaiah 64, it makes that distinction very, very clear. Notice in Isaiah 64, verse 4, it says, For since the beginning of the world, men have not heard nor perceived by, by God beside thee what he hath prepared for him that waiteth for him. 
It says, Thou meetest him that rejoiceth and worketh righteousness. Now, what is righteousness? Psalm 119, 172. All thy commandments are righteousness. Him that worketh righteousness. That's God's works, God's law, his righteousness, not our works. Those that remember thee in thy ways. Behold, thou art wroth, for we have sinned in those is continuance and we shall be saved and that's very interesting i'll get to that in a little later on in the program but we verse six are all as an unclean thing and all our righteousness are as filthy rags notice our righteousness and god's righteousness god's righteousness is good it's life and so on and then our righteousness, our ways, man's ways, is filthy rags to God. And we all do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. So plainly, there is a clear distinction in the Bible between God's righteousness and man's righteousness, which is sin and corruption and death. So here's that clear distinction. So when Jesus says, to keep my works, his way, his righteousness. It's talking about God's way, God's law, God's Ten Commandments, and not man's works. And that is a very important thing when you have to come to understand some of these scriptures about grace through faith, and man's not justified by the works of the law and so on. Once you understand what God means between his works and man's works, then these scriptures become very, very clear. Now, what about the Apostle Paul? The Apostle Paul, in Galatians, this is uh, some of people's favorite scriptures that they show to, sh to show that God's law is done away. Galatians 3, verse 10, it says this, And was the Apostle Paul anti-work? Yes, he was, but not God's works, man's works. Notice, Galatians 3, verse 10. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. Here we go. Now, all of a sudden, people start thinking, well, this is talking about God's law. Are you cursed if you keep God's law? You shall not murder. You shall not uh, commit adultery. You shall not uh, uh, bear false witness. Uh, remember the Sabbath day? <gasps> Uh-oh. Remember the Sabbath day. Yes, you're under a curse if you keep that one. The other ones, no, you're not under the curse. But that one, yes, shouldn't keep the Sabbath. Are you under a curse if you keep the Sabbath? Now, God says that if you find the Sabbath a delight, you shall ride the high places of the earth. Isaiah, the 58th chapter. So the Bible says, no, you're not under, under, uh, not under a curse if you keep the Sabbath. What does this mean? You are under the curse. For it is written... Cursed is everyone that continues not in all things are written, which are written in the book of the law to do them. Did you catch that? Did you catch that clear contradiction? Now, it's not the Bible contradicting itself. It's man's interpretation of the Bible that contradicts. Notice, let me read that again to you. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, curses... Cursed is everyone that continues not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. How can the works of the law be God's law and then say that you're cursed if you continue not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them? That's a clear contradiction, isn't it? Unless we find out what is the works of the law. What does that mean? It says... We do the works of the law, we are under the curse. This is a quote from Deuteronomy, the 27th chapter. And when you read the curses that are in that chapter, it's all the curses of those who break God's law, not keep God's law. So what are the works of the law? Is it keeping God's law? No. The works of the law is breaking God's law. See, there are two laws in the Bible, which is clearly... Uh, shown in Romans, the seventh chapter. Romans 7 talks about two laws in the Bible. In verse 21, the Apostle Paul, speaking here, 
And in verse 12, it says that the law is holy, just, and good. Talking about God's law. So he didn't find the law something terrible. He found it holy, just, and good. It says in verse 21, I find then a law that when I, when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind. That's God's law. It's warring against God's law and bringing me into captivity to the law of of sin which is in my members there's the other law the works of the law sin brings you under the curse the curse of the law which is of course the death penalty the wages of sin is death Romans 6 23 the, that's the law that the Apostle Paul is talking about here in Galatians the third chapter the works of the law sin those who practice that are under the curse and cursed is everyone that continues not in all things which are written in the book of the law, keeping God's law, as the Apostle Paul said in Romans the seventh chapter. But that no man is justified by the law. Now what does that mean? Does that mean God's law? Well, Romans 2.13 says, the Apostle Paul said, the doers of the law are justified. Clear contradiction, right? Well, no, it's not a clear contradiction when you put it in the context to which the Apostle Paul is talking about. But that no man is justified by the works of the law, which is sin, breaking God's law, in the sight of God, for it is evident that the just shall live by faith. Now I'm going to explain that in a minute, but let's go on to verse 12. For the law is not of faith. What does that mean? The works of the law, sin, is not of faith. But the man that doeth them, what? The law, God's law, shall live in them. You do the law, you shall live in them. And that's a direct quote from Leviticus, the 18th chapter, verse 5. You see, if it meant all God's law, then there's a clear contradiction here. The law is not of faith, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. That's a clear contradiction. He says, the law is not of faith. We should live by faith, verse 11. And then he says, the law is not of faith, but then we should do the law? Clear contradiction, unless you understand what the works of the law are. And to put in context when he says justified by the law and so on, that he means the works of the law and not God's law. Now the just shall live by faith. Does that mean God's law? Let's go to Deuteronomy, the 32nd chapter, Deuteronomy 32. And it says this, here is a prophecy of Israel and talking about Israel when they receive all their blessings that they would forsake God, verse 15 of Deuteronomy 32. Then he forsook God, talking about Israel, which made him and lightly esteemed the rock of his salvation. They provoked him to jealousy with strange gods. That's the second commandment in the law and the first commandment. With abominations provoke they him to anger. They sacrificed unto devils and not to God, to gods whom they knew not, to new gods that came newly up, whom your fathers feared not. Verse 19, when the Eternal saw it, he abhorred them because of the provoking of his sons and of his daughters. And he said, I will hide my face from them. I will see what their end shall be. For they are a froward generation, children in whom is no faith. Here they are breaking God's law and he's saying, these people have no faith. Keeping God's law is the law of faith. How do you show your faith to people? How do people know you are a Christian? Well, by keeping the laws of God. If you kill and swear and cheat and murder and... You worship another God, not the God of the Bible. You don't worship Jesus Christ. You worship some other God. Is that faith? Is that faith in the God of the Bible? No. But if people see that you keep the Sabbath, keep the holy days, you keep, you know, you shall not kill, and you keep, uh, you shall not commit adultery, people see that you are a Christian, and you are showing 
your faith. And what did James say? That I show my faith by my works. And in John the 6th chapter, as I read to you earlier, a little later on, they say, how do we do the works of God? And he said, to believe on him that God sent. Talking about Jesus. Showing your faith. Showing your faith by your works. That's in John the 6th chapter. So faith is clearly keeping God's law. Well, life's been pretty good. Summer home, yacht, vacation when I wanted. <laughs> Some little kids sure spent a lot of time with that. Too bad they never last. Yeah, a lot of things are like that. The kids are grown now, and hmm, Sammy and I aren't getting any younger. Hmm, is this all there is? You can know the answer to this age-old question. What is the purpose of human life? Download your free copy at BritishIsrael.ca So faith means keeping God's law. Matthew, the 23rd chapter. Here's another scripture. Here, to the Pharisees, he's saying this. Woe to you, verse 23 of Matthew 23. You scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, you pay tithe of mint, Annas and Cummin, and have omitted the weightier matters of the law. What are the weightier matters of the law? Judgment, mercy, faith. These ought ye have done, and not to leave the others undone. Faith. God's law contains faith. God's law is faith. All right. Now that we know what faith is, a lot of people go to Ephesians, the second chapter, Ephesians 2, verse 8, it says, By grace are ye saved through faith, not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, here we go, works, lest any man should boast. What works? Well, we learn from the Apostle Paul that the works he's talking about is man's works. He was against man's works, not God's works. Notice, People fail to read the, end, the next verse. They just kind of stop at Ephesians 8, uh, 2, 8, rather, and they don't read the rest of it. For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, unto good works which God hath before ordained, that we should walk in them. God's works. He that keepeth my works unto the end shall be saved, Jesus said. We are God's workmanship. It is God's works that is working in us that we should be saved, that we walk in His works, not our works. We walk in His works that we shall be saved. But notice, verse 8, For by grace are ye saved through faith. What is faith? Keeping God's law. We receive God's grace through faith. God's law. Romans 5, 17, grace reigns through righteousness. God's law, what is righteousness? Psalm 119, 172, all thy commandments are righteousness. And Psalm 119, 29, in the NIV version of the Bible, and here I have it here, the NIV version of the Bible, which correctly translates this verse, notice, be gracious to me, through your law. And the context of the whole chapter is talking about the law of God. Grace is through God's law. That's your Bible talking. That's not me speaking. That's what your Bible says. And it is the gift of God. Do you know that righteousness is imputed to the Christian? And it is a gift, the Bible calls it, the gift of righteousness. Read Romans, the fifth chapter, in its full uh, context. It is a gift. It is not something that you do. No man is righteous before God. God has to give you that righteousness as a free gift. And we are saved by grace through faith. It's a gift given to you. Grace, the grace of God through His law. And then what? 
The Ten Commandments of God is written on the fleshly tables of your heart. 2 Corinthians, the third chapter, verse 3. What do we see? We receive when we are saved. The gift of the Holy Spirit, which writes His law on the fleshly tables of our hearts. The inward man, as the Apostle Paul said in Romans, the seventh chapter, I delight in the law of God of, in the inward man, the, his mind. That's the heart of man, the mind. And that God's law is written on our hearts. Simple, folks. Now, here is a direct statement from Jesus Christ. From Jesus Christ himself. Are we to believe Christ? Are we to believe what Christ said about salvation? He was the Savior. He was the Savior. And he is the Savior. And he said this. Here is the rich young ruler in Matthew the 19th chapter. Matthew 19. And he plainly says to Christ, he says, verse 16, Behold, one came unto him, and he said, Good master, what good thing must shall I do that I may have eternal life? There, here is the question, and Jesus answers it in Matthew the 19th chapter, verse 17. He says, Why do you call me good? There is none good but one, that is God, showing his humbleness. But if you are to enter into life... Now, the Apostle Paul said, grace through faith. Be gracious to me through your law. Grace reigns through righteousness, the Bible says. Jesus says here, if you are, enter, are to enter into life, keep the commandments. That's grace through faith. Grace through the law. God is gracious to us through his law. And that's what the, Jesus is saying here. Now, what about the command that says that we should believe on Jesus and we shall be saved? Does that contradict the law? Is that a contradiction or is it, is it in the law of God? Believe it or not, that's the first commandment in the Ten Commandments. Let's go to the Ten Commandments. In Exodus, the 20th chapter, I'm going to end with this. And you'll probably, probably see something you've probably never seen before in your life first commandment in the law of God, it says this, I am the eternal your God, which brought you out of the house of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. Now, what did God do in Egypt? Well, in Exodus 15, other places in the Bible, Deuteronomy, it says that God saved Israel from Egypt. It says that God redeemed Israel from Egypt. Now, Hosea, the 14th chapter, here's an interesting uh, quote from God himself, who repeats the very commandment I just read to you. In Hosea, the 13th chapter, verse 4, it says, I, Yet I am the eternal your God from the land of Egypt, and thou shalt know no God but me, for there is no Savior besides me. Now, as we learned earlier, God's law is faith. It is the law of faith. And the first commandment, God repeats it, and he says, there is no Savior besides me. What is that telling you? It's telling you to have faith. The first commandment in the law is telling you to have faith on your Savior. Believe on your Savior, Yahweh. And who is Yahweh of the Old Testament? Jesus Christ. There is no contradiction. The first commandment in the law of God is telling you to believe on your Savior, your Redeemer, and your Justifier. You know that in the Old Testament, it says that we are justified in the Lord, in the Lord God. There's no contradiction there. It is the first commandment in God's law. 